Welcome everyone to our Two Posh Podcast. I am Gabrielle and I am here with my co-host, Marcella, my daughter. Hello. And our spider, DJ, technician, everything. 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 <laughs> and um, Dr. Greg Jamalis, our Hi. optometrist and founder and owner of Laser Fit Scleral Contact Lenses out of Capel, Texas. He is back with us in this show. We are going to talk all about especially the uh, LASIK, uh, the situations lately that are coming up more and more with LASIK surgery Mm -hmm. gives people big problems. And um, I got, I had heard a little bit about it through the years, but I hadn't paid that much attention. And then in December, there was a meteorologist from Detroit. Her name is Jessica Starr. And I don't know why she touched me so much, but here's this, beautiful woman who is 35 years old with two little children married has a dream job and is a happy person and she had LASIK surgery and then one month later committed suicide by hanging of all things with because she was so desperate in so much pain she couldn't go on and I did some research and I remember when this happened I sent it to you because I was like oh my goodness look at this Mm -hmm. and Dr. She, who is known as to, I wanted to know everyone his little nickname, which I think is so cute, um, said, wow, this is very sad, and I could have possibly helped her. And when you said that, I was going, what you created and founded is so unbelievable. I have looked, and I've heard the test. Testimonial. Oh Thank you. <laughs> English is her second language. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, wow. I feel like no one, not not enough people know about you. And there's such a, when you really look into it, the they want you to, to believe that there's only a 1% chance of something going wrong. Yet when you really look into it, it is more like 20%. That's a huge percentage for something to go wrong. When I surgery. had no idea, because I think with your vision and then everyone around you is kind of like, oh, get LASIK, get LASIK. I got LASIK. It's fine. LASIK, LASIK, LASIK. And I'm, I was always like, oh my God, I could not lay there with my eyes wide open and a needle. Come. I'm like, no, I can't do it. But I think that you hear that it's just the best thing ever. It's no big and deal. I actually didn't know anything could go wrong until you showed me that, which was recently. And that, that's interesting. Isn't I know. It? And yeah. then that's why I felt so, I was like, we have, I asked you to come on the show for that reason because I think that it's important for people to be informed about it. And if they want to do the surgery, there's, I mean, just inform yourself. Like, don't just go in it and think that it's not an issue because it's the world's most popular elective surgery, which is, I mean, it's, you don't have to do it. People just want to do it because they don't want to wear the contact lenses anymore. They don't, don't want to wear glasses. And, um, um, I was looking at some of these cases because there is now uh, 12 people that have committed suicide. The people that have not committed suicide but are having these complications are living like in purgatory. Like it is, they are in so much pain every single day. They get depressed, there's anxiousness, there's uh, so many things that go with that that is devastating they say their eyes they want their eyes ripped out of their head it is a non-stop horrendous pain like they feel like needles are poking them in their eyes constantly they feel like they're they're on fire well i mean how many times do we blink right is it just every i mean what happens like what is some of the stuff i guess you can tell us yeah i wanted um i have a lot of cases that i was going to read some of the stories and then i wanted for um Dr. Jamal is to tell what he thinks about it. But there's one, I want to just read one. And this is the newest um, story that just came out literally like yesterday. And it's investigation reveals several LASIK patients took their lives due to severe complications. Um, and from LASIK. Yes. Um, at least three LASIK patients who suffered severe complications after refractive eye surgery have ended their own lives. Investigative reporter The news comes as the LASIK industry maintains the procedure is safe and effective. 
It doesn't get easier for Nancy Burleson each time she visits her son's grave. The hardest part is waking up every day knowing I still have to exist without my child. Her son was a son any mom could be proud of. He fought for his country in Iraq. When he returned, he had LASIK eye surgery, which started another battle. He had dry eyes so bad that he was having to put eye drops in every five minutes. Burleson says her son stopped going to his college classes and eventually lost his job. It was difficult to leave his apartment. The pain was described as needles in his eyes. Then came the light sensitivity. I'd never heard my son cry before. I don't know what to do. I've lost everything. I've lost my GI Bill. My education is on hold. I cannot drive. I cannot get a job. In his suicide note, part of it read, I hope someday you can understand that I couldn't go on without my eyesight. I trusted a doctor that destroyed my eyes. Imagine not being able to see the computer screen TV people's faces. Burleson is not the only person to bury a loved one after refractive eye surgery. Many people across the country say they're worse off after the surgery than before. I can look up at the moon at night and see up to eight smeared overlapping moons, says this lady that is a support group organizer. She started an online support group after her surgery left her in so much pain. The group has more than 6,400 members and even more joined after Detroit TV meteorologist Jessica Starr killed herself last year. Starr publicly talked about problems after her eye surgery. If anyone understood the consequences of his surger- of this f- surgery fully, there's no way anyone in their right mind would do this. Eye refractive surgery involves using a blade or laser to cut a flap across the surface of the cornea. Once lifted, a laser smooths out the underlying tissue, improving vision to 2020. Over the two decades, it's been done more than 19 million times. They say it has a 96% satisfaction rate, but that is untrue. However, an FDA database that chronicles patients' problems uncovered hundreds of serious complaints from patients after surgery. More than 700 complaints described the pain worse than childbirth. One patient oh described the eyeballs would stick to the eyelids almost every night. There was also a report of a father who killed himself. Um, I've had patients with significant problems eight years later. That is the, that is the problem. They say that this can of I like you can come out of the surgery and be fine, but mm-hmm. you can have problems starting at any time because oh. whatever the surgery is, just from a, a a bump or whatever, it can come unlodged and then start problems. Um, I, yeah. So this is just one of many many stories, and I wanted to get your opinion and your expertise and tell us a little bit what you have encountered and who you have helped. There's so many people you've helped. I've seen people crying (laughs) because you gave them back their life and you are so humble about it. No one would ever know. So I need you to tell everybody. Well, first of all, this is a very, very serious topic. Right. Uh, We we really have to uh, take a deep breath before we start talking about it. I agree. Um. Yes, I've I've known people who've had bad outcomes, and I've known people who have taken their own lives, uh, not just from LASIK, but from other surgeries involving the eyes, involving trying to improve the vision. And, uh, you know, I I don't, something about me does not want to sensationalize these things, you know, because it's it's very private and it's it's a very dark place to go. Mm Mm-hmm. And so, yes, um, uh, every surgery has complications. Um, I see only the ones who have problems. I don't see many of the good ones. I I used to, but because I'm so specialized now, I just see the ones who have have bad outcomes. So I tell people this if they're interested in LASIK. I I just tell them, um, do your research, do a lot of research, and... You know, expand your uh, knowledge base beyond the three or four people that you know personally who who've had good results, because their outcome, your outcome, might be totally different than theirs, depending on your particular situation. So, mm-hmm. uh, I think people oftentimes research buying a new car more than they'll research <laughs> this. I believe, but that. that is the truth. And I remember I came to you and I asked you, and I will never forget. You looked at me, and you, were in your calm way, you said, I mean, you can, of course, do it, but remember, you have one pair of eyes. And if you are the one where something goes wrong, 
Mm-hmm. And that's all you had to say. I never even thought about it again. I never considered it again. I mean, sometimes I can look at a person and think to myself, they should never have LASIK. <laughs> and, and what am I seeing? I'm seeing uh, large pupils. Oh. And, and the younger you are, the more likely you, you are to have very large pupils. They tend to shrink as we get older. But um, I would say 90% of the patients I see today, I continue to see them, are younger people who have very large pupils. And uh, if they could only match the treatment zone to the size of the pupil, then there would probably be no problem. But that's not what always happens. And so it completely destroys their, their night vision. They have problems driving and, and with bright lights. And it, every time they see a bright light, it just, it just it's garish, you know. They, they don't like it. And when I, when I look at the uh, little YouTube clip that this meteorologist made of herself, I could see her, she was often looking up. I could mm-hmm. see her eyes just drawn to the lights up there. And I, I think that was part of her issue too. Uh, you know, she's in an environment, her work environment involves very bright lights. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all around. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, any, any chronic disease uh, that, that causes pain and, uh, you know, will we'll increase the odds ratio of that patient taking their own lives. You know, they can, people can only take so much of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't claim to understand. I, I, I don't claim to be able to predict who's going to do that. Right. I, I've tried to figure it out. I know that in each case, I remember something that was a little different about that case. But nobody ever said I'm going to kill myself or, right. you know, even cause suspicion in my mind that they would. In fact, I recently learned uh, a patient I'd known for many, many years uh, had recently taken his own life. And I had not seen him for about four or five years. But to do with his eyes? Mm, yes. He, he mentioned that he couldn't take the pain anymore. So I, I, think I don't want to go into names or right. anything. No, of course not. But it, it's like I've seen because of this meteorologist and what happened to her, doing my research before we came here today, a lot of people that have lost their son or father or whatever, are coming forward on purpose because they want to get the story out. They want for mm-hmm. other people to know. Like Marcella never had any idea about it. So mm-hmm. there's so many that don't. And I I have been freaked out about it. I as as you know, I had a little hole in my cornea like when I was young and someone found it because I had surgery and they had to do an eye exam just to make sure that I was fine and they found it and I had to have laser surgery just to repair that. And even that, like it was such a small, I had nothing, nothing big. But even that, I I had to wear an eye patch. It was such a big ordeal. And then you feel weird. Like when something is wrong with your eyes, it's something that is very, very, it's painful. I poked myself with a mascara (laughs) one time. That was the most painful thing I've ever experienced. And to think that these people have to endure this day in, day out, it just, is with no hope and there are you how do we get people to know that they can come to you i know people travel from literally all over the world they come from australia croatia france you have had people come from everywhere um, that's true except maybe from antarctica uh, <laughs> well um, okay so vision is a very very important sense obviously and uh, when something goes wrong with it suddenly it's quite shocking, and um, I think it, 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 we all have a primal fear of going blind. Yes. There's not a person uh, who, who can think about prospects of going blind that isn't really freaked out by it. I mean, it, it's it very just scary. rocks you to your mm-hmm. core. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And every time you open your eyes, you see what you did, okay? You see the results of, of this. And so you can't really get away from it. The only way you can get away from it is when you close your eyes and you can sleep, mm-hmm. okay? Or drug yourself up or something. Right. You know? But in, in any event, uh, did you want me to talk a little bit about how I got into this? Yes, and, please. Okay. Um, all right. So years ago, um, I started my practice, as we discussed earlier, in Capel. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is in 1984. 
just about the time when RK surgery was becoming more uh, popular. And I would have people ask me about that surgery, and I would just say, nah, 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 you know, don't, don't go there. <laughs> Uh, but they would anyway. So uh, a few people would listen to me. But most mm-hmm. of the time, they just they just go down the street and ask somebody else and but until they find they like, someone yeah. who but says I'll say yes. yes, we'll agree. And so when uh, LASIK came on board, um, I was a little little skeptical. So I, I wanted to do a little bit more research first before I got on that bandwagon, you know. And um, <clears throat> So anyway, going back to the RK situation, um, you know, those people were difficult. Um, they would come in, they'd have vision issues and whatnot. Couldn't really fix them. Couldn't, couldn't find anything that would adequately please them. You know, they just seemed to be um, perpetually unhappy with their vision and, and, and with your work, you mm-hmm. know, with my work. I just mm-hmm. couldn't, couldn't Make handle them happy. it. Yeah. So um, Lisa came along and, you know, I, I was looking one day for uh, something. On, I was searching the internet for something negative, but not not negative in the sense that I hate LASIK, but some side effect. You know, mm-hmm. because uh, I was uh, I was kept kept reading about new complications emerging from this surgery, and I said, well, I don't want to be sitting here and have a patient in my office that has developed a complication that I've never seen before, and I wouldn't know what to do about it. So. Uh, I found a website called Surgical Eyes, and it was formed by a couple of um, patients who had RK surgery, the older one, in opposite ends of the country. And it was really a well put together website. They had a, a active forum. They had a medical director. You know, they they did all the right things. Mm-hmm. And um, I got I got involved in that forum. I, I was drawn to it, and uh, so I would. I would post things about eye care and, you know, just try to clear up some things. But I couldn't really say too much about LASIK because I didn't know too much about it. Right. Um, so um, I contributed a lot. You know, when I do something, I tend to go all in, right? So, <laughs> you know. Of course. <laughs> I, I, don't know, I don't know how to moderate my uh, participation when I get involved. So, um after a little while, uh, I got a call from the uh, fellow who ran the website, and he said, is it okay if I give your contact information to certain people who would like to talk to you? And um, I said, fine, you just you know screen them for me, so um, I'll, I'll make myself available. And before too long, I got a call from a fellow uh, in another state, and he was a psychologist, and he had LASIK and bad results, and... Um, he said, I think I'm clinically depressed. You know, he, uh, coming from a psychologist, I figured he, he knew. So, <laughs> he self, yeah. Um, I told him, I said, well, you know, I've been experimenting with different contact lenses and I had recently gotten some that I had custom, sort of custom ordered. And I've, I felt like these were going to be a lot more successful than any that I had before because there was n- nothing out there that was made for this newly shaped eyeball. And so I, I said, I can't give you any guarantees, but I'll, I'll give you about a 70% odds ratio. And he said, that's, that's fine. Take it. I'll take it. I'll, and he came and he's a big guy. He's over six foot tall. He towered over me. He sat in my chair and he had triple vision. I mean, he actually could see three different images in one eye and two images in the other eye. Oh my. Okay. That would make me nauseous. And I, I, I looked through my, I had a bunch of, lenses different shapes and I I picked out two that I thought would fit perfectly and popped them in his eyes and instantly his vision cleared up you know when when that happens it's very dramatic believe me yeah what did he do he sat there in silence total silence but his face said everything his face his eyes you know he started to well up with tears and I found myself feeling the same way. You yeah. Know? I said, yeah. this is such a powerful moment. I, I wasn't thinking that, but it was. Right. And that's when I decided that this was the type of work. You know, I had found a niche. I wow. had found an ability to help somebody who I couldn't have helped before. Right. And I see what it's done to them, you know. Yeah. That and gave me goosebumps. Me too. I'm mm-hmm. still. 
And so that's what I pursue, and almost single-mindedly, actually. I mean, I just, everything else became less important. And now my job was to take care of all these people now who were coming. Okay, so he goes, he went back to the forum, and he talked about his story. And a lot of people started coming. And, you know, one size just was not going to fit all. Not everybody could be fitted with those types of lenses, but it was a, it was a good start yeah and uh, <clears throat> so I, I basically devoted my life to trying to figure out how to fit more people to be able to help more people to expand the range of people I could fit and not only that but to overcome the limitations of what the, the existing lenses and and how could I improve the vision and the comfort and w- how I could uh, find something that would work with the dry eyes you know because you they didn't have enough tears to float the lens on the cornea. Oh, so okay. there's that problem, yeah. Yep, that was a big problem, the dry eyes. Yeah, you could correct the vision, but the dry eyes would sort of undermine everything you did. Right. And then I started experimenting with different lenses, and we had several manufacturers in Dallas, and I could order all these lenses, and i get them the next day. Wow. And uh, I, I stumbled onto something called a macro lens. It was a larger lens, and it actually fit on the white part of the eye. It's like a soft lens, okay, but it was rigid. So you get the vision-correcting um, abilities of the rigid lens and, and the comfort of a soft. And so we, we worked in that uh, um, with that type of lens for a long time, and I published several papers. And, and uh, But then, you know, the scleral lenses... Uh, they weren't very well known then. The scleral lens is basically a lens that fits on the sclera. It's an RGP lens. And it's made out of a, a rigid gas permeable material. And um, most of them were being made by a company out in Boston, Massachusetts called the Boston Foundation for Sight. And Perry Rosenthal was a Harvard-trained MD who started that organization and made it into a not-for-profit so he could help people who couldn't afford the care. And one of my patients went to him and her eyes were too dry for the lenses that I provided her, but she was able to find relief through those. So that opened my eyes. Yeah. And I met the executive director and I saw some of the lenses and I was so impressed with how they looked. And I said, you know, I got to really start working in, in this direction. Yeah. And so that's what I did. I just focused on how can I make lenses like that? And then it's not enough just to have a bunch of lenses you can try on people because that was too hit or miss. Mm hmm. I had people coming from all over the world. They would come in on Monday, and they'd be leaving on Saturday. <laughs> Just trying to find a lens. I, I don't have time to be poking around and trying to find a lens I don't have right. to fit them. So I said, you know, if I'm going to continue doing this, I need to have the ability to scan an eye to understand what the shape is before I put a lens on the eye. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't know what the shape of the eye is. We had no way of measuring it. So I... I discovered this type of scanner and and started using it and one thing led to another and uh, so that's kind of like the the origins of of the laser fit thing and then of course you know the vision uh, was not fully corrected for everybody so now you start trying to investigate the visual aspects what what do we need to know what don't we know and I wound up getting an instrument called an aberometer, and it measures the vision in many, many, many places through the pupil. It shoots one beam of light through the pupil, traces it to the back of the eye, then it shoots another one in a different location, and then it traces that one back to the retina. And then you get a picture of where the light is going, and then you can alter the lens surface to send those individual rays to the right spot, you know. Goodness. And uh, so I, I, I published a bit um, back in 2005, and I managed to publish each year. The last one was 2008 when I published uh, what I was doing with this new scanner, that I was actually making lenses from these scans, and got a patent on that and a few more. Smart. And are these, you're helping people with LASIK problems or is this just anybody Well, okay, it started problems? out with LASIK problems okay. or, or any type of surgical issue. Okay. Because these these people were, did, they had they had an unmet need. Nobody was fulfilling their needs. They were, mm-hmm. they were a little bit unusual. 
And uh, so by the time I got all that worked out, it became apparent that this lens would be ideal for other things like keratoconus and, and corneal conditions that are, are acquired by, you know, nature that weren't induced. Right. Um, so I see uh, many, many, many types of patients now, probably slightly now in favor of keratoconus. I've become... Uh, what is that? Exactly? It's, it, well, it's, it's, okay, you've heard of LASIK ectasia. Have you not heard that? Okay. No. <laughs> like, I don't know that. All I right, do. so basically uh, keratoconus is a disease. We can't figure it out if it's genetic yet or not, but uh, it, it involves thinning of the cornea and weakening of the cornea such that it will not withstand the fluid pressure inside the eye. The fluid pressure will... It's like a tire with a bulge. Mm-hmm. Okay, there's a weak spot in the tire. The pressure finds it, and that's what it does with keratoconus, and it causes the cornea to become distorted, so you don't have a regular focusing element. It's very irregular, Okay, and it causes a lot of vision problems. Okay, And we don't – or ordinary optics cannot address this problem. You go to the eye doctor, you get a pair of glasses. It doesn't work. Okay. okay. So then that's what you're doing now. Well, well, with everything else. I might be getting too far ahead of the conversation, so <laughs> no, no. feel free to stop me and we can go back and revisit the LASIK. Yeah. No, I I think I, I s- know all of it. Yeah, me too. I want to know. All, I, I'm so interested in all of it. So you just keep going. and. Okay, so, um, I you know, I have not... Uh, the, the LASIK... Um, patients continue to come um there are a lot more people fitting these lenses now so are there uh not not my particular type but i mean just there there are more lenses available now in 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 more places for these people Uh, obviously this is this is many years later Mm -hmm. right i mean i started all this 15 20 years ago and uh so there but but i think it needs to be better known Um, right and, and this is what kind of bothers me. Uh, we know people have problems with LASIK, and we know that they go through the seven stages of grief, okay? And I wrote those down so okay. I wouldn't forget them. You know, the first stage is shock and denial, okay? I can't believe this happened to me. <laughs> this is not happening to me. Yeah, yeah this is not happening to me. And then there's pain and guilt. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, I did this to myself, okay? Oh, uh, yeah. And then you, then there's the anger. Somebody did this to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I'm angry with them and myself. Then there's depression because nobody understands. Right, you go from one provider to another; they think you're crazy. Okay. Um, <clears throat> then finally, if you're lucky, you make it to the other side. You you accept it, and you try to put your life back together and work around Fix your it. your situation. Oh yeah. But a lot of people will come to me in the first stage. I'll hear from them within months. They're in a panic, mm-hmm. anxiety. High anxiety. That would be me. <laughs> so be. I, I try to give them hope. I, I think that's what's missing here, hope. Mm-hmm. But yeah. That's what I feel like and, when and I'm I, reading. I've, there's no hope. Too many times I'm the last person. Yeah. You know, I, I'd like to be maybe the first. But, you know, where does a person turn when this happens? They go right to the Internet. Mm-hmm. It, wouldn't you agree? Yes. And what do they see there? Okay, is there anything, is there a resource for them? And is there something that can give them hope? Is there hope out there? Mm-hmm. I think we need to work on that part. And is there for people who are panicking about that, when they do go research, is there something that shows them a hopeful something? Like besides I, the support? I don't know. I hope if they get to my website, it does. But, I, you know, we're in the process of... Uh, reworking parts of the website so that we can offer that message would be more apparent and, mm-hmm. pi- and picked up by the search engines a little bit mm-hmm. better right instead of just like a technical description of what i do right which we have to do because people don't really understand the technical part um so it's all it's uh that's that's always been a, a complaint of mine that uh, the internet is a dark place and if you if you if you run across the wrong story or something, you know, you might get the impression that your life is doomed mm-hmm. and, and over. And you know, why why bother? But um, uh, you know, I don't think I I've not run across anybody like this meteorologist who who couldn't get past the first Month. four months or three months or whatever it was. So that's my first goal when I uh, when this 
person reaches out to me, get them to be hopeful mm-hmm. and be reassuring. Try to be reassuring that, yes, we've helped many, many people. We can help you. Yeah. You know, it's not the end. Right. And that that sentence alone is right. probably very comforting because... When you're panicking and you think that you can't get fixed or something is really wrong, that's the worst feeling ever. So when someone says you're going to be okay, we can help Mm -hmm. you. I mean, because what even what what he just said uh, from what I read, a lot of these people in their panic go back to the same doctor, and Mm. they're trying to get help, and then that doctor suggests more surgeries, and then they go to somewhere else, and then. It's just somebody that suggests something else. They're not specialized like you are. So they have gone, not her, but other people have Mm -hmm. gone in and out of doctor's offices and nothing helps them. Nothing helps them. So that's why they get more and more deeper into a depression. And And there is no hope for them because they don't find it. Absolutely. Yeah. So we need to make sure. How do we do that? How do you, how does one go about doing that? Well, I think this, starting like this, the, yeah. with something like this and, and having it out there and hoping that, you awareness, know, I guess. awareness and with hashtags and whatnot and keep with our quotes and whatnot and keep it out in the world to hopefully have people. I found a closed Facebook group. I asked to be let in, but I have not had the surgery myself, so I don't know if they will allow oh. me to get in there. Um uh, there is places where people are searching so forums maybe i will add this everywhere <laughs> i i have truly when i was researching this i was so affected by it and i was going if we can just help one that'd be have amazing you, have you tried uh from the perspective of a of a, of a, of a uh, lasik yeah. patient um approach the internet looking for help have you done that like ask the questions uh, that they might ask. I, I I did a little bit, and mm-hmm. I, you know what the sad part is? It it took me to sites like LasikSuicides.com, dot com, which mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. not very hopeful. No. I mean that's kind of that's the worst. That's no. scary, mm-hmm. right? But that's I mean that's really what what happened. So that's why I'm I'm like very excited you're here that you're talking about it. I I am I'm so hopeful that the people that are going oh wow. This is how we found you. Well, I think you're doing a great public service, not by interviewing me, but by being concerned about this and wanting to do something. And uh, we need more people. But you have like a big you. part in it. <laughs> <laughs> you are the biggest part of all of it. Well, and that has to be such a rewarding feeling mm-hmm. for you to help people like that. I mean, I think I'd like cry every day that I, because you change their lives, like bring them their life back literally change yeah. their yeah. lives because i think i saw you once because i had a dry spot on my eyelid and it ripped like something off you could put like a little <laughs> band-aid on my eye, like contact band-aid and it made me feel so much better because just blinking i was like oh my god i can't see take it mm-hmm. and that was only like this short mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and i can't imagine what that would be like they and right. pain and sensitivity and just i mean people losing their jobs can't drive i mean you change people's lives. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, you do. I I also wanted to just for a moment get away from just the LASIK. I just wanted to ask you, what what do you tell people? How do we keep our eyes healthy? <laughs> yeah. Like, what can we do for real? Like that we don't go blind. Like there's these, um, there's cataracts, there's glaucoma. What is that? What does that mean? How do we prevent it? Mm-hmm. Well, the best thing you can do is be healthy yourself. Feed your body the right nutrients. Don't abuse yourself, you know, with mm-hmm. drugs and other things. And um, you yeah, just see your eye doctor uh, now and then, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm not going to say how often, but, you know, a lot of these things can be picked up early. In fact, you know, we get better and better at picking things up earlier and earlier. So we can prevent more vision loss than used to be the case. So. And glaucoma is one of those things that we can pick up pretty easily. What is that? Um, well, that's a disease caused, uh, well, that causes optic nerve damage. Okay. And, and you know, you, we used to think, oh, uh, high pressure caused this. And so we, we would we check your eye pressures, and that's what you, com- what's commonly referred to as the glaucoma test. Okay. Where they 
pop some air in your eye or something or put an cool. instrument on your eye to I measure the pressure. Uh-huh. And uh, so we would put them in certain categories depending on their pressure. If it was over like 22 was in one category, over 25, another and so forth. But now we realize there's not one pressure that's good for everybody. So uh, we look more now at the uh, anatomy inside the eye. and But we will control it with pressure. You know, we'll control the disease. We'll try to treat the disease by bringing the pressure down with eye drops. Okay. But, um, you know, it's, the, it's that um, pressure imbalance somewhere in the in the region of the optic nerve, you know, doesn't get enough perfusion or something. And, okay. and the nerves start to... No, that that's a little bit unclear as far as the research goes. Okay. Yeah. And well, and I have a question about, you know, our phone. So, you know, when we were little mm-hmm. uh, or before the phone, you weren't allowed to sit really close to the TV because they said it's mm-hmm. bad for your eyes. Is it bad that we're like in our phone this close? Yeah. But like what are the long-term yeah. vision risks with all the I just screens well, we're exposing <laughs> ourselves to? Because I'm, like I'm like this at nighttime. I'm like, I don't know if this is too close. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but your vision's fine, right? It is. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. But I mean, later on, am I going to be like... Long-term effects. I shouldn't have had my phone so close. <laughs> or they have those new nah. glasses. No, it's not. Here, here's the deal. So um, what, are, what are the facts? The facts are that more people are getting myopic. More kids now are nearsighted than ever before. And I used to go to all the schools in Capel. I used to go to the same middle school every year. Every year I'd take a show of hands of kids who were wearing glasses and it went up from about four out of 20 to 10 out of 20, you know. And so there is, there is a myopia, they, we, we call it a myopia epidemic and especially in some Asian countries. So there is some kind of genetic involvement, but you know, it, it's possibly due to that we're using more um, digital screens now, you okay. know, we're doing a lot more close work and if you think about how the eye focuses things, you might understand how that can trigger myopia. Okay. And and it's how the, what happens is the retina picks up that there's blur there. Okay. Mm-hmm. A certain type of blur, then then some signal is generated for the eyeball to to grow mm-hmm. to reduce the blur. Mm-hmm. And and that process uh, results in myopia. Okay. No. So okay, what do I say about that, kids? Yeah. Right now in China and other places, they're discovering that myopic kids seem to lack. What they lack is outdoor experience. Mm, oh, okay, yeah. they're not going outside enough. Mm-hmm. Okay. They're going to hibernate with their computers or their iPads or pods or whatever, and they need to be outside playing sports and getting some vitamin, getting some vitamin, vitamin D. D. And yeah. Yeah. And maybe there's more more to it than that. Okay. I was curious. Well, I also saw that they now have gene, I say it wrong, gene therapy where they help blind people see again and they, they're using human stem cells to print artificial corneas. That's so Isn't cool. That wild? I read that. That is, that is very mean, cool. Really? Have that you works? ever had anything, a case like that before? I have not, but I've kept my eye on 3D printing for many years because I looked at it as a technology that might be helpful to me if I could print a lens in the office uh, very quickly, then I could see if it would fit very quickly. But, um, you know, it's nothing. I haven't found anything for contact lenses yet in the 3D printing world. And I've been, went to a big convention last year in Fort Worth and looked at a lot of 3D printers and none, none for making contacts, yeah. but none, and certainly none for making corneas. But that's a very interesting concept that you could build up a biological tissue by printing these cells layer by layer. Wow! I think that's amazing. It's amazing. So yeah. if someone, like one of my dance moms, once lost her eye, so she had a glass eye, uh-huh. can you? You ever make it where you can see out of that, or no? That would never work. <laughs> no, no. no, you can never see out of if you lose it. <laughs> well, you said she has a glass eye. Yeah, so she's, no she's got to go find her eye somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious. <laughs> so that's my stepdad. Oh yeah, that's <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. It's actually interesting that when you lose an eye completely, that the other eye adjusts because he can do everything. He can drive. Yeah, he can do everything. I mean, it's insane. You're just they'll drive like that 
But do you have depth perception problems? Well, you sure, have depth. You no, know, you can have depth perception with one eye. It's called monocular depth clues, and you know we automatically judge distance by lighting and shadows and whatnot. So, I um, have bad depth it's not, perception. It's not going to keep you from getting a driver's license. No, interesting. Now, I you tried to make me use. Contacts. I never mastered it. Oh, I try. I, I, I try tried to, to force them it. on yeah. you. Is that what I did? Oh no! <laughs> you, tr- you tried. I never mastered it. I could. I could not figure it out. So, I still manage throughout the day. But at nighttime, I actually have to wear glasses. Imagine that. She is so goofy. She will not let anybody see her in her no. glasses. Oh my god! Oh my god. You know, I for still some want reason, to see you in an eye patch. <laughs> well, I had to have one I'm, twice. I'm just saying, I want to see you. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I mean, glasses still have a function. Yeah. You know. I wanted to see if you could take us. I want to go back to the LASIK uh, or anybody with vision problems that you can help with um, your lenses. Can you give us, take us through what happens when they come see you and that process of the five days? I think there are five days with you, correct? From beginning to end. Just give us a short synopsis what they can expect okay. so people know. Well, that grew out of the fact that I had so many patients coming from outside of uh, Coppell and specifically from other states and internationally. And, and so I said, well, what is the reasonable amount of time we need to take care of that patient? And I decided five days. Okay, If it went over five days, probably not going to be a viable business. Okay. <laughs> so... Um, but, you know, there's, there's a lot uh, that you have to do in those five days. It's not mm-hmm. easy, okay, with a patient you've never seen. You don't really know the extent of their mm-hmm. issues. Mm-hmm. But, you know, uh, the initial part is the contact with the patient. They'll reach out, and then you have a conversation. We used to have a lot of conversations, more now than more, – more in the past than now. I don't know what that says about our society, but – that conversation is important because it set, sets the expectations, what we can do, what, what we think we can do, what we think we can't do. So they, they arrive on a Monday, and we do the basic eye exam, and then we take them through our, our scanning stations, and we, we scan the shape of the eye, and, uh, and, and then we use the laser scanner for the vision. Um, I go back in my office and use the software to construct the lenses. I design them. And then I send those files. They're special computer files I send to the lab. The lab um, makes a lens out of those files. They're basically computer, uh, they're lathe files is what they are. They instruct the lathe on on what to make. And we get delivery the next day. So uh, I'll give True Form Optics a little plug here. They're they're the ones who uh, make my lenses primarily. So... um, so then, then we get the delivery the next day, and uh, we see the patient after the lenses come in, put them on the eye, evaluate them. Usually they fit really well the first time. Uh, we may have to tweak a few things for, to improve the comfort and whatnot, and then we start measuring the vision again, and then we do that every single day until we've done the best job that we possibly can. Yeah. We can't do any better or, you know, until, until we're, we're both satisfied. If we're, not, if we're not, why aren't we, you know, what, what is it going to take? Is it going to take another day or two? And sometimes, yes, it will. And, and I, I try to make the patients aware of that in right. advance that they might, we might need another day or two. But usually after seven days, there's nothing left that I haven't tried. <laughs> wow. I'm working with a professional athlete now. Uh, we've, we've gone through probably about 20 different lenses, I think, because his, his, uh, his visual demands are quite unique. So. Oh, really? Quite different than yeah. the other people. Did he have problems with LASIK surgery? No, no, no just not at all. No. vision itself. So I just wanted to say that, you know, there, there are extreme cases um, that, that might take a little bit longer, but that's very unusual. Yeah, rare. Yeah. And then people But leave. we're able to get very sharp vision because of our wavefront technology, and that's something that can focus the light much better and... About 16% of the patients we found uh, wind up being able to see 2010. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. Because we can correct the optics so well. Uh, some we, we don't correct as, other, uh, as much as others because they've got corneal issues that interfere. You know. But I remember the first uh, patient 
who came to me, she was an optometry student who had LASIK. She was a second year student. She had LASIK and she had huge pupils. She had terrible night vision. She had, and then she had some complication in one eye that left her with this huge astigmatism. And she was not able to find a solution. So she came to me and I, I used the, I was just starting to use the wavefront technology. And, and I remember the first pair of lenses she could see 2010. I'd never, that was just so novel to me, you know, to be able to see how clear the optics were and how well she could see 2010. Just like we rattle off 2030, she rattled off 2010. And, and she would always tell me how well she could see compared to her peers Wow. that they would go to a basketball game and sit in the nosebleed section yeah. and she could see eye color and, and different oh people. Gosh. You know, <laughs> and, That's and cool. was, she says, I can see the faces. color of a person's eye from across a 20 foot That's room. Crazy. Wow. Mm-hmm. wow. So I, I always thought, well, that might be interesting for a baseball player or something. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. if they could see that well. Yeah. Wow. That's so cool. Is it true that if you look at, someone's eyes you can see if they have a brain tumor um sure because the optic nerve is uh is part of the brain and uh a a tumor is a space occupying lesion so it will increase the pressure inside the head and push the tissue into the eye you know sort of we call it um, edema so the the optic nerve will have a characteristic shape to it has that happened in your office where you see it and they didn't? Uh huh. Uh huh. Yes. Uh-huh. Oh. Several several times. I don't like it when it happens, but yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. you have to be prepared for that. Right. You know, I I have migraines my whole life, and I was always so scared that that's what I had. And I would go to him and go, "You can still see if I have a tumor, right?" <laughs> you would tell me, and he's like, yeah. "I would tell you, you're fine." <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have eye cancer is another one. It's very, mm-hmm. very, very unpleasant. Uh, it's something I never want to see again. Um, and the average eye doctor will see two in his career. Wow. That's, That's how rare it is. Very, my, my stepdad had that. And I probably was in practice for 20 years before I saw my first. Oh, wow. Really? Um, yeah. Are there symptoms to that or just you go to your job? Well, she was able to pick up something with her vision. It wasn't right. And I did an exam and I said, well, okay, so this, she needs a lens with that lens. She can see better. Um, if I had stopped there, then I wouldn't have found the tumor. But then I said, I, I did the second part of the exam, which is to dilate the eyes and look at the retina. And that's when I saw it. And it's very, yeah, very, very uh, terrifying. Really? Really? Mm-hmm. It's the ugliest thing you ever want to see. Really? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Cancer is a nasty thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That you posted it, and there is uh, Israel, Israeli doctors have they claim they're on the path to a cure for cancer, and within a year, that's the mm-hmm. that's what they're saying. Really, mm-hmm. so, I, j- I just read that myself. That's yeah. breaking news, really. Yeah, it's breaking news. Wow. So one advantage to Facebook, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So that that oh, would be amazing. Be amazing. Yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, you know, there's rumors that they say they have a cure for cancer. They just don't want to tell you because it's a Well, business. usually the uh, <laughs> the hype is out ahead of the, the the truth. So, you know, you have to watch those stories. You know, right, yeah. People, journalists are quick to emphasize the positive aspects of everything. So. Right. Or the negative. Yeah, know. or the negative. Either way, I know. <laughs> So that brings me to our question of the day. I have a question. <laughs> what is it, Zella? I don't know. <laughs> oh, I was like, I don't know what the question is, this one. Well, this one, I think we're going to just go very easy because I wanted to see what is our guest's favorite restaurant. Oh. Of what food do you like to eat the most? And you don't have to say Austria. Yeah, in Dallas. Uh. Uh, oh, what's your I favorite to, restaurant? I have to say in Dallas? hmm you want me to plug a restaurant? Sure. If it's your favorite, go right ahead. I would say the one that we go back to. There's actually two. Can I? Can I? Yes. Put two. Um, Utaka Sushi Bistro. Where's that? It's um, it's off of McKinney. In Dallas. Mm-hmm. Okay. I've never been there. No, me neither. Never heard of it. I 
me to go. Interesting. I know. <laughs> I've been right by it. I've just never been in. Oh, yeah. And I it's, love CCTV. It's right behind, I think, around the corner from CNH Oyster yeah. Company. It's on, uh, is it Bowl Street or something like that? It's in a little shopping center, and you, it's difficult to find, really, but he is uh, a master. He's, uh, you know, he's Japanese. Yeah. And he has Japanese chefs and um so that and uh my wife and i really like the mercury because they have such a nice uh selection of different what is that i've never been there either the mercury it's off of forest lane in dallas and north dallas forest and preston okay i need to go to both those places Mm -hmm. and i love yeah i know a gentleman uh he's um he's very very uh oh he's a gourmet and you know he's traveled the world and uh he he can go anywhere he wants, and he he also likes the mercury, and uh, so it's just not uh, well known, I guess. No, it's kind I of understand. it's kind of like neighborhood standard. You okay. Know? Chris Ward is the uh, the chef, and he was involved with uh, I, I guess the M Group, and they had a, a chain of restaurants in Dallas. Isn't and I've forgotten M-Group? what the other ones were. Mm. It sounds familiar. I don't want to say. Yeah, anything. I don't want to say too much because it's I kind of murky know. in my mind. I'm never very clear <laughs> yeah. on what the structure is anymore. Yeah. How about you, Stella? Your favorite? Um, in Dallas. Yeah. I mean, Dallas and surrounding. You know. Well, yeah, that's true. Um, what is my favorite? Sushi and um, well, sushi restaurants Densetsu, which is a very small sushi place. We love that sushi. Plano. Just not. The atmosphere yeah, doesn't we, go with we'd it. We'd like <laughs> to have a better atmosphere. Yeah, but the sushi oh, is great. Oh, what's wrong with the it atmosphere? Home. It's just, just quiet. It's a little it's hole in the wall. Hole in the wall, you know. I like to have a lot of going on around. Well, me. maybe that's just, <laughs> uh, that's Utaka is like that, too. It's, it's very small. Yeah. But yeah. I'll go because I love good sushi. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other sushi place that I love, and that's a good atmosphere, is Uchi in Dallas by Zaza. Oh, okay, yeah, I've so been there. Good. been there. Did you like it? I did, I did yeah. but I'm not, still partial. Not like <laughs> yeah, the Utaka. I wonder if I, no, I don't think I've been there. I don't know. What's yours? I, I love Ocean Air. It's one oh, of yeah. my favorites. Oh, yes, that's that. another standard. Mm-hmm. We love that place, too. I love I've that never place. Been there. And then I like the atmosphere of Table 13 in Addison. I love going there. Hmm. Have you ever been? No. You need to try it. You would never expect what's inside of it when you drive up. It's it looks like it's nothing, and you probably go, "Where is she sending me?" <laughs> if you go inside, it is like it's table thirteen is called because they call it Frank Sinatra used to have a table in New York that was table thirteen where people couldn't approach him, and it is very New York mob mafia kind of vibe. Oh, they, yeah. and they have <laughs> and they have um, singers. Do they try live to? Music. Um, make it that way or is it's it just that way by be. accident no okay. it's i think it is very meant to be that way so actually. everybody gets a table 13 right <laughs> yeah no, there is one table oh, 13 one. and there you can ask for it and then there's another one that's right in front of the band and i always call that the mafia table because it looks like that's where they would oh. sit so <laughs> yeah. i like to go there and anyone who's listening let us know your favorite restaurant How about where you, we Spider? should go uh my favorite restaurant is called ruins it's, it's a down in deep element, central and South American food. Huh. It is excellent. They have crickets and stuff sitting on oh the Oh my God. I can't do it. I just, so good, my though. neighbor just told me about that yesterday. Literally, I was like, how could you eat crickets? What are you kidding? Are they chocolate like little, covered? No, but no, they, they have all kinds of spices on them, but it's yeah. just like a little bar snack. That's what she said. No, she must uh, have been there. At that, you have to ask her if yeah. it's that restaurant. Wow. <laughs> could you eat crickets? No. <laughs> that was a simple no. <laughs> no way. Well, there's a lot more besides crickets. Oh, my goodness. I'm I actually looked think. it up. They look gross to the... Oh, no. Cannot do that. But I feel like where I li- uh, live at the shops at Legacy, I feel like there have so many now new restaurants that are fun and good. Oh, and, and I love Fogo de Chao. That's oh, a, yeah. That is one of my favorites. Do you like that one? I haven't been in a while. Um, yeah. I get Sorry. too full. Like we, we don't, I don't eat out that much. <laughs> no. you, you would think that I would. But yeah, no. I yeah, like that. And then everything like, Mexican. I like eating at home, too. Yeah. So Us I cook. too. We cook. You cook? Yeah. yeah. I, I don't. So yeah, I eat out. <laughs> <laughs> You'd starve then. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It's not that I don't. I'm not good at it. I just am so ADD. I'll start it. And then I'm like, oh, somebody finish the rest of it. <laughs> I am so, I get distracted. Or I'll start it and I'll walk away and I'm like, oh, gosh, I think. 
I was cooking. I burned cookies. I mean, it's just <laughs> not the best at that. When she does it, though, she does I a can't really do good it. job. Mm-hmm. But when I'm just committed. Want to. But yeah. you're a great appreciator. I am. I'll of eat somebody it. else is cooking. Yes. And I'll tell you how delicious it is, and I'll keep eating it, and I will. That's how they keep me cooking. See, that's so <laughs> She always gets invited to dinner then. Yes. Mm-hmm. Always. Mm-hmm. My kids are invited all the time, <laughs> so that's what keeps me cooking. Or we come over it. like, what's in the refrigerator? What did you cook? Mm-hmm. I want to eat something. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> so on that note thank you so much and this i love the show for the, the simple sake of giving people hope that mm-hmm. are in a situation that have bad experience with lasik and thank you for that so much for their and vision at all well, thank yeah, you for vision. inviting me this has been very very interesting very fun <laughs> thank you. i'm glad you came i really really appreciate it thank and you. please give us the website one more time www.laserfitlens.com. Awesome. The, uh, yeah, everyone go there for hope, to give people hope that have problems with or vision. someone you know. Someone you know, yes. Guide them to Dr. G. I will vouch for him. He is amazing. He's been our optometrist for 30 years, and I would not go to anyone else. So thank you. Yeah, but I don't see you that often. Now. <laughs> thank God. <laughs> <laughs> thank God. <laughs> Gino, maybe. Gino. Yeah, he goes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank so, you so thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate both. It. It's been wonderful. <laughs> thank you.